Hello, thanks for being with me. Last night in the Parker House, we had my and John's 31st anniversary party and our daughter Hannah's 27th birthday party. She was born on our anniversary. And when she left this morning, she passed something to me that I gave her years ago. And I got this idea out of a magazine of this woman communicating with her daughter, just writing things in the journal from her heart, and the daughter would write back, and they would have that record. And so the first entry in this is actually from January 15th, 2008. And so through that year, um, Hannah wrote, I wrote back, it's got a lot of fun things in it. And then she found this, going through organizing, decluttering, she found this the other day. And so she wrote me um, an entry from 10-2. I'm sorry if you can't see that. Um, and it was such a gift. And so, of course, I wrote her back, and when we see each other again, then we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. Because there were things in there, she said, Mom, I want to talk about this revelation I got about the parable of the sower. And I wrote, hey, I got this revelation this morning about how we make decisions and how it's not the way we're supposed to make decisions, which I may or may not talk about on another broadcast, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, so, I'm talking mostly today about really important things that you can do for your kids and um, about nurture and admonition that the Bible tells us that we are to practice in raising our kids. And I, along those lines, toward that end, I was rereading a great book, a very old book, and um, it's entitled The Christian Nurture of Children. And I um, don't know if you can find it, but she talks about the parents getting the admonition part right, but not the nurturing part right. She says, admonition is good, but there's always danger that one's admon admonishing may be ineffectual. The greatest danger is that admonition is given without its scriptural accompaniment, nurture. All admonition and no nurture may make the child uninterested or doubtful or antagonistic to Christianity. We have got to get our hearts right so that we trust God enough to do things His way. And that just comes from time in the Word, giving your life to Him and growing, let him, letting Him grow you. Um, she writes, there is ever the, greater, or the great danger that admonishing may become nagging. Mm. Parents, put them in mind again and again of some fault, but do nothing else about it. They do not try to help the child to do the right or correct the bad habit. This admonition is often given in a more severe tone as it is continued and becomes what is rightfully called nagging. Can't you hear a mother say, ah... This one, how many times have I told you? La, 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 you know. So, we got to think about how this is affect. What we do is so powerful as mothers, as wives, and how what we say is affecting those around us and get a biblical view of, of admonition and nurture. And, you know, it, we as humans, we tend to get in one ditch or the other. We're either all about the nurture. Um, and I, I was hearing someone talk about this, how, uh, we will we are really good at the you go girl you can do it and we're not good at the saying you stop girl you can't do that that's not what you want to do that's not going to work out right and here's why and so I want to talk about something that we did with our kids that was really I thought uh, inspired and that was we trained them when they were small just you know those things that you're gonna you have to train them and they can't understand why. They just have to know there's a consequence I'm not going to like if I do this thing. You're going to save their lives. Teaching them to, when you speak, they need to listen and obey. And then they get a little older and they develop. And you begin to have house rules. We had house rules. And they were always about making home a wonderful place, a pleasant place. Uh, things like respect of other people's property. 
Now that's a good rule to teach them for adulthood, okay? Um, things like respect other people's hearts so you don't speak hurtful things. Um, and just, we had house rules. One of mine was, for, for my sanity, was you don't run in the house and you don't yell in the house. So I could take my kids places and they wouldn't, you know, older people who didn't have kids liked our kids. Kids need to know that they're liked. They need to know that they know how to behave. That gives them a security. Um, and then as they got older, sometimes, well, actually one time I remember them questioning, well, why this rule? And so I said, this rule is based in Scripture. Scripture says, don't steal. Scripture says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do you want your sister or your brother coming in your room without asking, dumping out your Legos, leaving them all over the floor? Do you want that to happen? Well, no. And so I began to build in them a, a thing that I didn't, these rules didn't fall out of the sky. And once in a while, there would be a rule that just fell out of the sky. It wasn't a good rule. And as we would go along, we'd realize, you know, that they can't quite grasp that rule. They're not ready for it. It's too difficult. It doesn't serve our purposes or whatever. And they were able to see us say, you know what? I apologize. That is not a good rule. We're going to change that. And they had input. So as John told them, it's a benevolent dictatorship. It's not a democracy, but it is benevolent. And we will listen. We will consider. We will prayerfully go forward. Um, and so it's a, it's a developmental thing where the child grows into feeling that they have say-so, they have input, um, they're valued. But you don't let a two-year-old have say-so and input in how you run your home. Um, that creates chaos and insecurity and actually causes a child to grow up fearful when there are no boundaries and they can't trust you to be wiser than they are. So nurture and admonition balanced. Uh, and according to the Word of God and being led by the Holy Spirit as you parent, day in and day out, it's a day in and day out thing. Never think you're going to get this formula. I read this book. This is our philosophy. This is how we raise our kids. You don't get to live by formula and raise kids by formula. So just, just remember that. And remember how important what you are putting into your minds and your kids' minds is and how powerful it is. I read this book when I was 10 years old, and it shaped my life. I didn't know it was shaping my life, but I never forgot it. And it's called Pilgrim's Inn, and it's by Elizabeth Googe. And um, let's see, on page 48, she said something that stuck in my heart, and it's still there. Um, now, this is about Lucilla who is this grandmother who, who makes this home, the Pilgrim's Inn, for the healing of her, her family because of the scars of World Wars I and II in England and the deaths and the loss. And um, so she has a daughter-in-law named Nadine, and her name is Lucilla, and she says, Lucilla always knew, and Nadine knew in her more domesticated moments, we're going to talk about domesticated moments in just a moment. That it was homemaking that mattered. Every home was a brick in the great wall of decent living that men erected over and over again as a bulwark against the perpetual flooding in of evil. But women made the bricks, and the durableness of each civilization depended upon their quality. And it was no good weakening oneself for the brick making by thinking too much about the flood. We're in a mindset of, of thinking about the flood and looking at what's happening out there instead of concentrating on the inner source of all victory, which is what we do in the home.